afternoon to one and all. On behalf of the executive committee and the scientific committee of PMAS, I would like to invite you all to this webinar on uh, therapeutic FSS by Dr. Shami Shastri, uh, professor and head department of um, immunometrology and transfusion, KMC Manipal. Madam. Transition medicine from SCPGI Lucknow, and uh, she has an advanced certificate in transition medicine by ATM. She has received many awards and accolades, the uh, most important ones being Young Scientist Award by IS team. She has received Harold Gunzan Fellowship by ISPD, and uh, she has also received ISPDI Young Scientist Fellowship. And she has uh, 75 publications in uh, indexed in national and international journals. Madam is a guest faculty at various national and international conferences, and she is a resource person for World Health Organization training programs, and she is a reviewer for the international journals in transition medicine. Madam is a member of ISBT, ISTM, and ATOM, and she is an expert committee member and subject expert at uh, National Medical Council and the uh, Hemogenes Program of India, NOIDA. Madam has established the following for the first time in Kosovo, Karnataka. Uh, those includes FRSA services, the state of the art immunology lab. The Red Honor Registry, which is for the first time in South India, Therapeutic FRSS, Cascade Filtration, Hematopoietic Stem Cell Collection and Storage, and she has identified PNL phenotype, which is a rare phenotype for the first time in India. Over to you, ma'am. So, uh, thank you uh, to Transition Medicine Academy Society, the team members, and uh, all the members of this society for uh, giving me this opportunity to discuss about uh, clinical applications of uh, therapeutic FRSS. Over the next one hour, we will be discussing about uh, principle and technology of therapeutic FRSS, the rationale and the indications, the evidence-based guidelines and the recommendations with the help of some uh, case scenarios. First of all, what is FRSS? Uh, it is derived from a Greek term and it is used for the first time by Abel et al. in 1914. Uh, um, uh, let me use a pointer. Yes, yeah. Uh, it is nothing but a process in which uh, blood is removed from a subject and uh, it is continuously separated into different components. The desired components will be retained while the remainder is infused back to the subject, either donor or the patient. Um, the basic steps involved with the FRSS is separation of components and uh, the separation may take place with the principle of filtration, centrifugation or with the combination of both the filtration and centrifugation. Filtration is mainly based on the particle size. As you all know, the cellular components of the blood has got different particle size varying from uh, 3 micron for platelets to 13 microns for granulocytes and the filtration is based on the different size of the cells and uh, whereas the centrifugation the principle is mainly based on the specific gravity of different components of blood the specific gravity of plasma is 0 0.025 whereas for the cellular components it's high uh, for rbc it is highest that is 0 0.093 uh, based on the specific gravity the centrifugation separation efficiency is determined so the separation efficiency is also influenced by the g force and the dwell time that is the inlet uh, flow rate so if we uh, look at our equipments uh, of FRSS, uh, they use this uh, uh, principle of uh, centrifugation. And um, you're all aware that there is a collection interface in uh, each of these uh, FRSS equipments, which monitors the position of the cell and the plasma layer and the amount of light passing through the sensor. So uh, depending upon the amount of light that passes through or the reaches the sensor, it uh, guesses about uh, the possible uh, blood component which is present at that position. So there is an interface detector which has got a threshold point. For example, if uh, the, the program uses low G, then uh, the um, collection interface may lie on the granulocytes. 
if uh, the program uses medium uh, g-force then the collection interface may lie on uh, the mononuclear cell similarly whenever high g is used it will be on the platelets so there is a threshold point here and uh, when uh, the threshold point is reached there will be initiation of spillover phase uh, during apheresis this is how we are able to collect the desired component with the principle of uh, centrifugation now if we look at various apheresis equipments it is very important to decide which equipment uh, to uh, have it for our center and uh, uh, how to choose the FRSS equipment, especially for the therapeutic procedures. Um, the FRSS equipments can carry on uh, several different types of uh, uh, procedures. It may be the collection, collection of platelets, peripheral blood stem cells, monocytes or the, uh, granulocytes, or the depletion where we can do depletion of cellular products such as platelets, RBCs, and uh, processing that is post uh, uh, BMT, we can process the stem cells or adsorption uh, procedures where we can use various adsorption columns and therapeutic exchange, which we are all doing routinely. That's a therapeutic plasma exchange, etc. So um, the most commonly used uh, equipments I have mentioned here and the various programs they use uh, for the therapeutic applications. The MCS plus by hemonetics. Here we can have uh, a collection of components uh, through various programs and the kits, platelets, red cells, and plasma, and different combination of components can be collected. Similarly, patient-related procedures, we can do plasma exchange, autologous red cell collection, or therapeutic cell removal and stem cell collection, etc. The other uh, commonly used equipments are uh, Comtech by Fresenius Kabi. Um, again, we have a range of the programs that are present in the equipment. So we can do therapeutic plasma exchange, red cell exchange, adsorption procedures, stem cell and mononuclear cell collection, granulocyte collection, uh, along with donor references. The spectra optia is also used in many of the centers. Here, uh, again, we have exchange procedures, collection procedures, and the depletion programs and the processing facility that is available. So whenever we choose uh, equipment, uh, then it should be based on the need of our center, uh, the patient load, as well as other factors, such as uh, the cost involved, the service, etc. Another important factor that we need to look into uh, with respect to the equipments used is the extracorporeal volume. So the extracorporeal volume ranges from around 400 ml to 150 ml. Uh, we should ensure that extracorporeal volume that is present on the FRSS kit should not exceed the 15% of the blood volume of the patient. Many of the centers uh, do use membrane uh, plasma exchange procedures. Um, however, uh, nowadays, most of the centers have shifted to centrifugal system. Uh, this is um, uh, a welcome change and uh, we have uh, various reasons for switching the centrifugal, switching to centrifugal therapeutic uh, plasma exchange from the membrane therapeutic plasma exchange system. This is due to various reasons. First of all, there is greater uh, plasma removal efficiency with the centrifugal therapeutic uh, system. The plasma removal efficiency is nothing but the measure of fraction of plasma removed during therapeutic plasma exchange procedures in relation to the amount of plasma processed. Uh, in centrifugal system, the the centrifuge causes packing of the red cells, though hematocrit is achieved around 80%. So there is higher efficiency or high increased removal of uh, uh, plasma. So the percentage of the removal efficiency is around 80 to 93%, whereas with membrane system, it is 27 to 53%. 
So if we process 100 ml of plasma, around 80 ml can be removed with the centrifugal system, whereas it's about uh, 30 to 40 ml using membrane uh, plasma exchange system. So to remove the same amount of plasma, around 1.3 plasma volume, we, need, we may have to process three to four times the blood volume for membrane system, whereas we have to process only 1.5 blood volume to have 1.2 plasma exchange. Another advantage of centrifugal system is uh, shorter total therapeutic plasma exchange time. Uh, here, um, with the expert handling the equipment, we can install the kit and start the procedure within uh, 15 minutes. Whereas with the membrane system, the priming and the setup time is said to be around 23 to 45 minutes. And centrifugal uh, procedure times were uh, on an average 15 minutes shorter than that of the membrane system. And we have a more flexible vascular access options with centrifugal system because the blood flow rate that is required is around uh, 50, 50 ml versus around 80 to 150 ml with membrane therapeutic exchange systems. And uh, this requires higher blood flow to maintain uh, the better uh, um, separation of the components. And uh, this requires replacement of uh, the placement of a central venous catheter or arterio arteriovenous fistula, whereas um, uh, centrifugal system, we can even use a peripheral uh, line to carry on the procedure. Uh, the uh, literature shows fewer clotting events with the uh, uh, centrifugal system and the clotting and clumping rate with membranous uh, uh, procedures is around the 67%, which is very high. And uh, even now uh, the centrifugal system equipment have fewer uh, side effects. It ranges from 2.4% to 0.4% for mild to severe adverse events. So this, it is much, much better than the membranous system. Then now it's time to go for the centrifugal uh, therapeutic uh, FRSS uh, procedures. And we have well laid guidelines to use therapeutic FRSS in various clinical settings. And this is uh, ASFA guideline uh, published in 2019. And this is the evidence-based approach uh, which helps and guides all the FRSS clinicians um, they have uh, indications based on categories. Here, I will be describing about what is category and what is grade. Uh, category one is um, where therapeutic FRSS is the first line therapy. And category two indication is where it is a second line therapy and it is done in conjunction with other modes. Category three is um, where FRSS has got optimum role and it is not uh, well, the, its role is not well established. Category four is uh, where FRSS is ineffective or um, maybe harmful sometimes. In addition to this, the grading is also mentioned in the ASFA guidelines. So let us learn what is grading. So the grade criteria is grade G-R-A-D-E is grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation. So we have grade one, which is a strong recommendation, and grade two, which is a weak recommendation. And uh, within grade one, we have A, B, C uh, sub-criteria, which means A is with high quality of evidence, and with B, it is mod with moderate uh, quality of evidence, and C is low quality of evidence. Uh, so to um, summarize about uh, the grading and the indications, we have uh, category one to four. In addition to that, based on the expert opinion and uh, relations with other treatment and uh, with the severity of the disease, it can be a strong recommendation or weak recommendation. And in addition to that, we have um, quality of the published evidence, which adds on to the, the existing guidelines where we have high quality of evidence or moderate or low. 
So if you look at uh, uh, ASPA guidelines, they have mentioned for each indication, the category of and the grading of the, um, the therapy application for FRSS. So there we have different uh, options that are available, um, mainly the therapeutic plasma exchange and uh, the cellular depletion like uh, erythrocytophoresis, thrombocytophoresis, leukocytophoresis, and uh, cascade uh, plasma pheresis where we can use columns like amino absorption, uh, lipid pheresis. Then further, uh, the recently uh, introduced photopheresis, rheopheresis, and even for cellular therapy, we can use pheresis uh, uh, technology to derive the desired component. Now let us discuss this one by one. Uh, first of all, regarding the indications, uh, we, we can divide these indications under different headings uh, that come under neurological disorder are mainly uh, for category one, we have acute inflammatory demyelinating uh, neuropathy and uh, CIDP that is chronic inflammatory demyelinating disorder, myasthenia gravis and uh, paraproteinemic demyelinating neuropathies. These are all these are all under category one indication where it is a, a first line therapy with good quality of evidence and with, it is a strong uh, recommendation as well. And uh, for ADEM and uh, multiple sclerosis, it is category two indication with the slightly weaker um, uh, evidence towards uh, performing uh, FRSS. Coming to the hematological uh, diseases, um, it is uh, first line therapy for hereditary hemochromatosis, hyperviscosity with the uh, hyper gamma globulinemia and uh, sickle cell disease, thrombotic uh, microangiopathy. And this uh, guideline also provides about the modality, whether we need to do a cell depletion or plasma exchange or RBC exchange, etc. So uh, uh, this particular recommendation, every FRSS physician needs to uh, go through and uh, they need to adopt it uh, in day-to-day uh, practice. Some of the renal conditions I have picked up mainly the category one uh, indications here. Uh, good pasture syndrome with the alveolar hemorrhage is category one indication. Focal segmental glomerular necrosis with recurrent uh, uh, recurrence is category one. And uh, under transplant setting, where uh, the where we do ABO incompatible uh, transplantation for desensitizing a living donor, it is category one. Even in some of the metabolic or the immunological conditions, therapeutic apheresis can be performed, uh, like in familial hypercholesterolemia. We can do lipid apheresis and uh, Refsum's disease, Wilson disease, plasma exchange can be done. Uh, in amyloidosis, it is uh, second line therapy. So if they are dial if it is a dialysis related amyloidosis, then uh, it is uh, indicated. Some of the miscellaneous uh, conditions to mention here, um, like in case of acute liver failure, High volume plasma exchange comes under category one and uh, poisoning, overdose of uh, mushroom poisoning and envenomination, then it is category two indication in the present guideline. So uh, mainly I have mentioned about category one and two indications. Uh, we do have uh, category three and uh, no, four category three indications mentioned in the guidelines. So how do we approach a patient based on the evidence-based guidelines? So decision-making is quite uh, challenging. Uh, whenever you get a request uh, for therapeutic FRSS procedure, first of all, we need to evaluate uh, the patient, discuss with the clinical team, um, get a thorough history and uh, findings of physical examination, assessment uh, treatment plan should be reviewed, and if it is if it comes under category one and two, then straight away uh, we can go ahead with the uh, procedure. 
considering some other points like uh, volume status of the patient if patient is hemodynamically stable uh, cardiovascular stability um, we have to check for vascular access and uh, um, other uh, uh, treatment modalities that patient is receiving the, uh, any other uh, concurrent medications he is getting all those things needs to be reviewed and further decision on appropriate number of procedures and follow up plan can be made that is uh, quite easy for category 1 and 2 indications but uh, what about a uh, category 3 indications because its role is not very well defined in such cases we can always uh, review the literature which is published since as per fact sheet has been uh, published and again consider all these factors the like the cardiac status comorbidities and volume status of the patient etc and uh, take a decision about uh, how to go about it whereas for non categorized then uh, we can also consider modified macloid uh, criteria so risk versus benefit uh, you know, we were discussing about uh, the approach to the patient based on the indication category 1 and 2 uh, it is straight forward that uh, we can decide and go ahead with the frss whereas for category 3 we need to do risk benefit analysis and uh, also review on uh, the um, modified macloids criteria uh, to see the efficacy of therapeutic therapeutic frss so what is modified macloids criteria uh, it is based on the pathogenesis of the condition the uh, how much correction that we will be able to offer and also its uh, clinical uh, efficacy so pathogenesis we need to check the mechanism of the dis uh, disease the current understanding of the disease process uh, to support a, a clear rationale for the use of therapeutic frss modality and uh, regarding the correction uh, we should be able to make a change and uh, correct uh, the abnormality uh, through frss and the third criteria is uh, there should be a strong uh, evidence that uh, therapeutic frss confirms a uh, benefit uh, that is clinically worthwhile uh, taking that risk so if uh, when we review this criteria and apply to the patient uh, it will help in uh, decision uh, making now once we decide about uh, the procedure there are various practical aspects that we need to look into first of all we have to explain to the patient about the procedure its risk involved the possible adverse events and uh, what benefits uh, that we can offer uh, with this therapeutic procedure so informed consent needs to be obtained from the patient followed by uh, the venous access uh, with centrifugal system uh, we can uh, do it with peripheral venous access however uh, there should be option for central venous access as well and uh, Uh, lab investigations to establish the diagnosis as well as pre procedural laboratory investigations uh, to know the ionized calcium level or um, to calculate blood volume and the plasma volume we need to have cbc uh, the coagulation status of the patient etc then uh, depending upon the condition uh, we have to decide about the replacement fluids to be used then various calculations uh, uh, to determine the volume to be processed uh, and uh, what is our goal with the therapeutic process during the procedure we need to monitor the patient mainly observe for the side effects and uh, manage these adverse events post procedure um, when uh, we have to i uh, know about uh, the the number of procedures that we are going to do and uh, during the follow up lab investigations uh, needs to be done to decide about the replacement and uh, follow up throughout uh, till our goal is achieved needs to be done now as far has given out uh, five important points uh, for both uh, the the frss clinicians and for the uh, patients to consider when we go for therapeutic frss 
And the first point is uh, do not place a central venous catheter if a peripheral vein access is safe and uh, it is an effective option. So in most of the adult patients, uh, peripheral venous access is uh, safe, it is quicker and uh, easily achievable. So whenever it is feasible, we should use peripheral vein compared to the central venous catheter. And these uh, recommendations are, again, evidence-based. They have given uh, the various uh, publications which support these findings. The second point uh, with regard to choosing wisely is do not routinely use plasma as a replacement fluid uh, for therapeutic procedures unless there is clear indication. Because use of plasma is associated with various so adverse uh, reactions, so like a patient can have allergic reactions or trali, etc. Uh, so albumin is an uh, effective replacement fluid for therapeutic plasma exchange. Albumin is preferred over plasma whenever it is possible. And uh, do not continue simple transfusions in patients with stroke from sickle cell disease who have iron overload. So if red cell exchange facility is available, that is preferred whenever it is category one compared to simple transfusions or other modalities like simple plasma infusion, we should go for a therapeutic apheresis. Um, here, the one such condition is mentioned where a patient with sickle cell uh, anemia with stroke. Uh, do not routinely monitor coagulation test during a course of therapeutic plasma exchange, unless the procedure is performed uh, daily. So for most of the indications, TPE can be performed on alternative uh, days. In such uh, cases, if there is no underlying coagulation abnormality, we need not monitor uh, or do coagulation tests on a daily basis. Do not routinely continue series of apheresis procedure without a predefined objective goal. So when we prescribe uh, apheresis in the initial procedural note or consultation sheet itself, we should have an objective goal mentioned there. For example, if it is a depletion procedure um, for thrombocytosis, mention what is your target platelet count. So depending upon the objective goal, we need to um, decide about the number of procedures to be done and the end point. Now let us discuss about uh, various therapeutic procedures so one by one. The I, uh, First, uh, I will go with uh, the depletion procedures or the uh, erythrocytophoresis. Uh, the current indications for uh, Erythrocytophoresis are uh, sickle cell disease, both in acute and chronic conditions. Hemochromatosis uh, in a patient with malaria with high parasitemic index, and in case of erythrocytosis, polycythemia vera. So let us look into this case of a 12 years old boy with uh, sickle cell anemia, seizures, dysarthria, arthria, and weakness on one side. So on CT scan, uh, they diagnosed that boy had uh, acute stroke with sickle cell anemia. So in this condition, the, um, there is a vaso-occlusive event where the sickle cells have blocked uh, the uh, vasculature leading to acute stroke. And uh, in sickle cell disease, around uh, 10 to 30% of the patients can have uh, acute stroke and around uh, 40 to 90% can have recurrence of the stroke event. Similarly, they can have acute chest syndrome where the fatality rate is around 1% in children and 4% in adults. In such a scenario, should we go with simple transfusions to improve oxygenation or should we go for red cell exchange? So uh, coming to the as far recommendations in sickle cell disease, the uh, apheresis modality to be adopted is red cell exchange, RBC exchange. And uh, in case of acute stroke, acute chest syndrome and uh, 
uh, severe uh, other complications with acute disease, it is category one indication for stroke and category two for chest syndrome. Whereas with non-acute uh, disease, uh, we can perform uh, red cell exchange uh, for stroke prophylaxis or in case of pregnancy and uh, with history of recurrent vasoclusive uh, crisis or as a preoperative management. So in this particular case where uh, there is um, a stroke and it is an acute uh, disease, so we can perform the red cell exchange is the uh, uh, mode of treatment. So using FRSS uh, machine, we can uh, replace patients uh, RBCs with the donor, healthy donor RBCs. And here we can achieve rapid adjustment of hematocrit and the uh, HBS levels. It replaces the sickle RBCs and decreases the viscosity. Thus, it reduces the addition molecules like VCAM1 and uh, also decreases the rate of hemolysis. And in this case, we are able to replace the patient cells in one ml to one ml basis. So there is no overload of RBCs. Thus, we can also reduce the risk of iron overload and the volume overload. So red cell exchange is preferred over simple transfusions in such cases. Here, what is the goal of red cell exchange? Um, this particular graph demonstrates the oxygen transport versus the hemoglobin level. In a normal person, the hemoglobin maximum, that is oxygen transport is maximum at a hemoglobin level of 14 to 16. Whereas in case of sickle cell anemia, hemoglobin maximum is uh, um, around 10 to 11 gram percent. So as the hemoglobin level increases in such patients, there is increase in viscosity. So uh, the oxygen transportation will decrease. So our target hemo uh, hematocrit is 30% or less. And in addition to that, we need to uh, decrease the HBS level less than 30% and uh, HBA level around 70%. So this is our goal of red cell exchange. Coming to the technical aspects, so we need to calculate the uh, exchange, RBC exchange volume that is based on the desired hematocrit and the total blood volume. It can be calculated based on the patient's hemoglobin and hematocrit level. And uh, our uh, based on our goal, we need to reduce the HPS level less than uh, 30%. So this is how we can calculate the RBC volume to be exchanged. And uh, if you look at the current uh, FRSS equipments, they have automated uh, programs for uh, RBC exchange. This is the display panel of uh, Comtech by Fresenius that I'm showing here. Uh, so uh, when we enter all the uh, values like uh, hematocrit pre-procedure, the expected hematocrit post-procedure and uh, HBS levels post-procedure, that is the expected level, we will be able to calculate the volume to be exchanged. And uh, here we have a uh, option to enter the volume of each RBC units that will be used and its hematocrit. So exchange will be in ML to ML basis, which is quite safe. Uh, the replacement uh, fluid which we use here is a red cell unit. We, it has to be fresh, ABO and um, HG cross match compatible. It's uh, preferable if we can use RH and uh, KEL and KID match uh, units as well. Uh, it should be leukodepleted and hemoglobin S negative. This is about the specifications of uh, RBC unit that needs to be used for exchange. And um, we have to do the procedure till we achieve the target uh, HPS level. So this is a very useful procedure in case of sickle cell crisis, but definitely it is underutilized as of now. Moving on to the hereditary hemochromatosis, where we can use um, uh, erythrocytophoresis. Um, this is a disease of iron overload. 
and uh, diagnosis is made with the help of serum ferritin uh, serum uh, ferritin levels as well as uh, the serum uh, transferrin saturation level so uh, therapeutic options available as of now are therapeutic phlebotomy uh, enchylation and uh, erythrocytophoresis is category 1 uh, indication with a very strong recommendation here so a commonly done procedure is phlebotomy uh, so if we compare the therapeutic phlebotomy versus erythrocytophoresis in this particular condition uh, under therapeutic phlebotomy we can collect one unit weekly or biweekly so we will be able to uh, reduce uh, around 250 mg of iron per phlebotomy and uh, if ferritin is more than 1000 nanogram per ml to reach our therapeutic goal we may require around 2 years whereas with the erythrocytophoresis we will be able to remove 800 ml every 2 to 4 weeks uh, by maintaining a post procedure hematocrit of more than 30% so a uh, two fold or more iron removal is possible with erythrocytophoresis and we will be able to achieve the goal within 6 months by maintaining isovolumia so um, this is the advantage this scenario clearly shows the advantage of uh, um, efferesis uh, technique now um, for erythrocytophoresis in hem hereditary uh, hemochromatosis so we can calculate the actual volume of erythrocytes to be removed it is based on this formula where we enter the starting hematocrit our target hematocrit and the blood volume of the patient the frequency uh, required is 2 to uh, every 2 to 3 weeks um and our target is serum ferritin less than 50 nanogram per ml moving on to the thrombocytophoresis the uh, current indications are uh, patients with thrombocytop thrombocytosis and who are symptomatic it is second line therapy and also it can be considered as uh, prophylactic or in secondary thrombocytosis however uh, the uh the existing evidence is not uh, very clear and uh, not very supportive in a patient uh, we can see thrombocytosis due to various uh, causes it can be due to clonal expansion like in case of uh, essential thrombocytemia or uh, polycythemia vera primary myelofibrosis or even in case of cml so in all these conditions where there is clonal expansion it is a category 2 indication it can be considered as a second line therapy however in patients with the reactive thrombocytosis following infection or sepsis or following surgery any inflammatory conditions or in patients with iron deficiency there can be thrombocytosis the role of therapeutic efferesis is not yet uh, clear and it is not at all indicated in spurious thrombocytosis where uh, um in case of microspherocytes which are falsely counted as thrombocytes it, the efferesis is definitely not indicated in uh, such conditions thrombocytosis in uh, 90% of the patients it is um, uh, where there is clonal uh, expansion it is due to uh, some genetic conditions like uh, mutations in jak2 or uh, calreticulin or mpl and uh, they can have uh, uh, adverse events like thromboembolism or bleeding Well, in one to three percent of patients per year, they can have thromboembolism or uh, bleeding. Can be seen even up to thirty percent of the patients. It is mainly due to the acquired uh, von Willebrand syndrome. So uh, thrombocytophoresis in such patients who are unresponsive to uh, cytoreduction uh, is really helpful and. Uh, uh it is a kind of bridging therapy in this condition so when we reduce the thrombocyte uh, platelet count the cytoreductive therapy may act uh, well and it may um be useful to relieve most of the symptoms related to that coming to the technical note of uh, thrombocytophoresis
thrombocytophoresis. So the procedure is indicated whenever the count is more than uh, 10 lakhs. Uh, and each procedure lowers the platelet count by 30 to 60 percent. The anticoagulation ratio here that we can use is um, uh, one to one is to six or one is to up to one is to 12. We can adjust and heparin has to be avoided uh, to prevent X, Y, O clumping of the platelets. Generally, we can uh, do 1.5 to two uh, total blood volume uh, processing. Uh, with that, we will be able to achieve around 50% reduction of the platelet count and it can be done daily or uh, it, it should be dependent on the patient clinical condition and uh, the goal uh, of uh, FRSS. So what is the goal of thrombocytophoresis? So here we need to, uh, we can uh, normalize the platelet count or uh, achieve at least uh, up to 450 um, count of 350 to 450 and uh, also we can monitor the symptoms uh, if the platelet count is not low but uh, symptoms are relieved then uh, we can uh, um, the increase the interval between the procedures so the goal of prophylaxis so in high risk patients is to be decided on case to case basis it is mainly to lower the platelet count and to relieve the symptoms of thrombocytosis. At this point, uh, I would like to share our experience of uh, doing thrombocytophoresis over a period of uh, six years. Um, here, uh, we had 12 patients and um, most of them had the secondary thrombocytosis. So three patients had uh, primary uh, essential thrombocytemia and uh, uh, these are the pre and post procedure parameters, hematological uh, parameters. As you can see here, uh, we have noted significant uh, decrease in the platelet count and uh, it was around 47% de decrease in the platelet count following uh, the procedure. So it was uh, quite uh, uh, effective in these uh, patients and uh, most of the patients underwent only one procedure because it was a secondary thrombocytosis. Uh, uh, the next uh, procedure uh, that I would like to discuss is about leukocytophoresis. Uh, this is indicated in patients uh, with uh, uh, hyperleukocytosis and who are symptomatic. It is a category two indication. Uh, hyperleukocytosis is defined uh, as a circulating uh, WBC count uh, more than 100,000 and uh, they may cause a lot of, uh, they may present with the tumor lysis syndrome or uh, DIC or leukostasis. Uh, the symptoms of leukostasis may be vague and uh, most of the AML patients can have leukostasis when uh, WBC count is more than uh, 100,000. Whereas uh, for myelomonocytic or monocytic subtypes, they can have leukostasis even at a lower WBC count and um, for ALL, because uh, the cellular size is slightly smaller, uh, the WBC count, uh, at, um, they see these symptoms at much higher uh, WBC count. Here we have a grading system uh, to uh, assess the symptoms of leukostasis. It is not only the WBC count, even if the patient has some, these, some of these symptoms of leukostasis, we, we may have to consider leukocytophoresis. So the grading is done based on uh, the severity of the symptoms and whether uh, it's uh, pulmonary or neurological or uh, stasis at other organ systems. So leukostasis is possible if there is slight limitation of uh, activity with uh, mild uh, neurological and mild pulmonary uh, symptom. Uh, if there is marked limitation in activity, then it is probable with visual disturbance and uh, severe headache or dizziness. And uh, in case of highly probable uh, uh, situation where uh, there can be severe limitation of activity, dyspnea, and uh, even to the extent patient can have MI. So uh, assessing the symptoms of leukostasis is important. Uh, with the leukocytophoresis, we can achieve rapid uh, reduction uh, of the uh, WBC, which improves the uh, tissue perfusion. 
So there is rapid uh, reversal of pulmonary and CNS manifestations that we have uh, discussed now. A uh, single leukocytophoresis procedure can reduce WBC count by 30 to 60 percent. And uh, in some of the patients, RBC priming may be required, especially uh, the uh, CML cases where uh, they have anemia. But sometimes it should be, uh, it may be a little dangerous because it can increase the viscosity and worsen the symptoms of leukostasis. So if there is no anemia, RBC transfusions should be avoided prior to leukocytophoresis and uh, based on hemoglobin, it can be uh, considered post-procedure. The next commonly performed uh, therapeutic uh, epheresis is plasma exchange. So in TPE, we have uh, five main goals in various uh, clinical conditions. Uh, it can be done to remove the antibody with harmful specificity like in case of transplant sensitization or to remove autoantibodies, immune complexes. It can be done to remove protein with harmful physical property, like uh, to remove uh, light chains or uh, in case of hy hyperviscosity or uh, myeloma. Or it can be uh, to remove uh, non-antibody toxins or endogenous toxins like LDL lipoprotein and uh, exogenous toxins can be removed like in case of poisoning and uh, sometimes uh, it is done to correct deficiency or uh, plasma factor like in TTP. So uh, these are the main uh, rationale that is involved with the plasma exchange. Here I would like to briefly discuss about uh, the mathematical principle involved uh, with the plasma exchange. So whenever we do plasma exchange, uh, the procedure goes on uh, in small uh, increments, though it is done continuously, small proportion of total blood volume is extracorporeal. So the behavior of uh, intravascular substance is uh, different from which is uh, distributed also in extravascular spaces. So this is a simple formula which is mentioned here, uh, which suits the intermittent flow uh, exchange. Uh, but it gets complicated as we add on the replacement fluid and whether the replacement fluid is given before the procedure or the after the procedure. So this mathematical uh, principle uh, is not valid for all the substances the amount remo uh, removed and uh, remaining at uh, the end of the procedure uh, may vary depending upon the substance uh, that we target. Uh, the accurate pr prediction is possible whenever the substance um, is completely intravascular one, like in case of IgM uh, or cholesterol or ALP. But um, a less decrease than expected uh, is, uh, happens in case of uh, extravascular to intravascular distribution of the substance, like in case of IgA. And uh, greater decrease than expected is observed um, in case of fibrinogen and complement uh, factors, where along with the removal, there is consumption uh, during the procedure. And uh, some of the substances like uh, potassium, glucose, and bicarbonate may not uh, change at all because it is highly in equilibrium. So to understand this uh, is um, this mathematical principle and um, uh, the behavior of various substance uh, that we target is very important uh, to determine the end point or the goal of the procedure. Uh, whenever we do exchange, um, um, we generally adopt, go for 1.5 to 2 volume exchange. This is because uh, when we exchange plasma volume, one volume plasma exchange, the fraction that is removed is around uh, 63% and uh, substance clearance may be around 77% when we do 1.5 volume exchange and uh, it may be up to 86% with two volume. But beyond that, even if we continue the plasma exchange, the clearance man, uh, rate may not be high and uh, even the risk involved may be higher than the benefit 
uh, beyond two volume exchange. And uh, there are a lot of factors that uh, affect the efficacy of uh, plasma exchange. Some of them are half life of the, uh, the target substance. So shorter the half life, there is less clinical effect. And the uh, second important factor is synthetic rate. Whenever there is rapid uh, synthesis, then the efficacy of uh, plasma exchange is lesser. And also the immunoglobulin class. As uh, shown in this table, uh, the IgM immunoglobulin, 75% uh, of it is intravascular. So even single TPE may be uh, effective. Whereas IgG, only 45% is intravascular. And uh, so longer interval, uh, uh, pheresis is, uh, has got greater uh, benefit. In some of the patients, uh, especially when uh, if you have done for ABO incompatible transplantation, you might have observed that uh, there is sudden increase in the titer of the antibody post procedure. This can be explained by a rebound phenomenon, where a rebound increase in concentration of immunoglobulin after a procedure to a level greater than that is seen initially. So uh, the possible reasons for this rebound phenomenon is removal of some of the inhibitory substances that are present in the plasma and uh, removal of the negative feedback on the responsible cell or the immune cells, as well as the, um, the as level of IgG decreases, the rate of synthesis of these immunoglobulin increases. So there can be sudden increase in the titer of the antibody. Now, how do we uh, tackle this problem? Uh, we can uh, opt for concurrent treatment with the cytotoxic agents. Uh, it can help, uh, help in increasing the efficiency of uh, plasma exchange. So whenever we get a case uh, for uh, plasma exchange, we need to uh, uh, write a prescription on uh, uh, or the procedural note where we have to determine the plasma volume to be processed and the volume of replacement fluid to be used and which replacement fluid and how much. So uh, we have to begin by calculating the blood volume of the patient here. Further, plasma volume can be determined using this formula uh, of 1 minus hematocrit into blood volume. So this gives the plasma volume of the patient. Then uh, if we are planning for a 1.3 plasma volume exchange in a 50 kg patient, we need to process around uh, uh, 3,500 ml of plasma. This is because uh, Yes. This is because all the plasma that is processed um, are cannot be removed. So uh, the only 90% of the collection will be uh, removed and rest will be the, um, um, the fluid that we will be used and the replacement fluid or the anticoagulant will be mixed in that. So the volume to be processed is much slightly higher than uh, the planned uh, plasma exchange volume. Uh, in this particular uh, case uh, where we are planning to remove 3500 ml of plasma, the protein removed will be around 170 grams. And uh, in 170 grams, the albumin uh, component is around 128 grams because 75% of the uh, protein removed is albumin. Now, if we are going for 100% albumin replacement, in that case, with 5% albumin, we need to uh, give 2,553 ml as a replacement fluid. But in case our choice of replacement fluid is fresh frozen plasma, then we need 11 bags. So this is how we have to calculate for each and every case. And uh, write in the case sheet that we would like to harvest 3,500 uh, ml of plasma and uh, with 5% albumin and the replacement fluid volume calculated is 2,500 ml. The anticoagulant that uh, um, will be used is ACD with saline to keep the patient hypovolume. So 
plasma phenesis order needs to be uh, on the patient's case sheet before we begin the uh, procedure. Uh, plasma exchange can be done in various uh, clinical settings. And uh, here I would like to choose uh, solid organ transplantation setting for the discussion. So in this scenario, in this scenario, exchange is done uh, whenever patient is pre-sensitized to, to recipient uh, the donor's HLA antigens and uh, the ABO incompatible uh, transplantation. Uh, in case of liver transplantation in acute uh, liver failure till the transplantation is done. And uh, even in patients with TMA following organ transplantation, exchange can be done. So as far as for guidelines, so uh, uh, for renal transplantation, the antibody mediated rejection or, or for desensitization, it is uh, first line therapy. And uh, ABO incompatible uh, transplantation, desensitization of the living donor, the desensitization in case of living donor, it is first line, whereas uh, uh, for a deceased donor, it's, it is category uh, three. Um, so plasma exchange is a very important component of all the desensitization protocols. Uh, as shown in this illustration, the aphoresis uh, should be done at the feed transplantation setting to decrease the titer. Okay. This is uh, for ABO incompatible renal transplantation. Till we achieve the target titer, we need to do uh, plasma exchange at regular interval. And uh, post-transplantation, it is on demand basis. Uh, the target antibody titer is different in various protocols. Some of the protocols I have mentioned here. Uh, in India, there is Rabindranath Hosp uh, Tagore Hospital protocol. And uh, many do follow John Hopkins protocol or um, Mayo Clinic protocol. At our center, the target titer is one is to eight. So we do perform uh, PPE pre-procedure to achieve this target. Um, in addition to simple plasma exchange, we can have uh, double filtration plasma paresis. Uh, which includes a second filter that removes immunoglobulin rich plasma fraction. This filter is a porous uh, plasma filter for selective depletion of plasma fractions like uh, immunoglobulins. The remaining plasma components are infused uh, back to the patient. So double filtration plasma presses can cause substantial loss of macromolecular coagulation factors. This is the major disadvantage of this procedure. So there will be significant decrease in the coagulation factors, fibrinogen and factor 13. So it may put recipient in a risk of uh, bleeding complications. We do have semi-selective immunoadsorption columns that are available. So the separated plasma, which is uh, from the centrifuge should be directed uh, towards these columns. It selectively removes the immunoglobulin by immunoadsorption. For example, staphylococcal A protein uh, columns are used. Uh, the advantage with this kind of uh, procedure is there is elimination of core chain specific anti-AB antibodies and uh, HLA antibodies as well. Um, so it is more effective. Uh, the staph staphylococcal A protein columns that are used um, interact with the immunoglobulins, mainly IgG type. We're discussing about uh, the protein A adsorption column. So here uh, we have a recent publication about uh, use of uh, protein A adsorption column and its efficiency. Uh, they have uh, proved that uh, it helped in reduce, uh, reducing IgG, G1, G2, and G4 uh, levels by 60%. And it was done on myasthenia grievous patients. So uh, choline receptor autoantibody levels were also reduced by 70%. However, they noted that the column markedly removed vitamin K dependent coagulation factors, so 2, 7, 9, 10, by approximately 40 to 
So this affected the, the coagulation parameters, the INR and APTT were increased by 59 and 32 percent respectively so there is a prolongation of these parameters uh, post TP. Uh, so they advise that coagulation parameter should be closely monitored whenever you use such uh, columns. Uh, ABO specific in immunoadsorption columns are also uh, available. It uh, uses antigen specific uh, absorber consisting of blood group A and B antigens that are immobilized on uh, Cephros matrix. So they are more selective compared to other columns and uh, it is highly efficient uh, uh, compared to non, uh, the non-specific uh, columns. However, uh, the disadvantage is it does not uh, remove the core chine specific uh, antibodies. So here we have a comparative uh, table between plasma exchange, double filtration plasma pheresis uh, and uh, with the use of immunoadsorption uh, columns, the efficiency is very high to remove the antibodies with the um, uh, immunoadsorption columns. However, the cost is also high and uh, availability is uh, plasma exchange and DFPP is quite easily available. Uh, the sessions required are uh, lesser with the use of uh, immunoadsorption columns. Moving on to the cascade filtration, uh, uh, where uh, we use uh, uh, these columns so along with the plasma pheresis. Here the plasma is diverted towards the cascade and then uh, the, through the cascade, the plasma is passed to remove high molecular weight substances such as immunoglobulins, LDL and uh, lipoproteins, etc. The low molecular weight substances pass like albumin easily passes through the cascade membrane. Um, so the main benefit of using cascade plasma pheresis, there is a selective depletion of plasma components based on the molecular size of the uh, substance and uh, uh, the reduce or no, the since we are uh, recirculating the patient's uh, plasma there is no requirement for the substitution fluid or the requirement is very very less and wide range of applications are uh, possible uh, as shown in this uh, figure there is no loss of albumin um, whereas we can achieve quite a significant reduction of IgG and uh, IgM uh, type of antibodies. So this image shows the clinical uh, applications of uh, cascade filtration. It can be used in various metabolic conditions, hematological conditions, nephrological and neurological diseases. We have different types of columns uh, available. Um, this is with the Waflux. We have 2A and 5A columns. 2A columns can be used to remove immunoglobulins, whereas 5A columns can be used to remove um, the LDL for lipid depressors, etc. Based on the clinical application, we need to uh, select the columns for uh, cascade filtration. Uh, this is our experience of using cascade uh, plasma pheresis uh, in a patient uh, with the hemolytic uremic syndrome. We have uh, done it on a 12-year-old boy with, who was diagnosed to have complement-mediated uh, TMA. Uh, he had anti-factor H uh, antibodies. So uh, we used to do conventional uh, plasma exchange. Uh, more than 10 procedures were done. However, uh, there was frequent relapse and the uh, patient had become refractory to this modality of treatment. So further, we adopted uh, cascade uh, plasma pheresis and eight procedures were done. With the cascade plasma pheresis, we have noted uh, that uh, there was overall 73% uh, reduction in the anti-factor H antibody levels and it was quite effective and uh, there was um, no relapse um, following the entire cycle. So it is quite uh, uh, effective in uh, such conditions. Whenever we do plasma exchange, uh, in addition to the target uh, sub substance, 
there is decrease in other uh, plasma constituents as well like coagulation factors so there can be decrease uh, of 20 25 to 50% decrease from the baseline however it will recover within uh, 48 hours uh, fibrinogen around 63% and uh, complement factors around uh, 63% platelet can there can be 20% loss of platelets as well uh, following the procedure uh, photophoresis is uh, uh, kind of a recently developed uh, technique and uh, very few centers uh, do it in our country. Uh, it is a category one indication in uh, some of the conditions like uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma and uh, it is st still has got investigational role in immune uh, conditions so, uh, like uh, inflammatory bowel disease or fanfigus vulgaris, etc. Um, so the main mechanism of action is uh, it has got an immunomodulatory uh, role to play. So ECP reduces the production of uh, effector T cells while expanding T regulatory cells. So T regulatory cells suppress the immune system uh, in an antigen specific fashion. And uh, uh, at the same time, it does not uh, uh, appear to increase the infection risk. So uh, it is being tried uh, in uh, several uh, conditions nowadays. And there are mainly two methods that are, that is an inline method and offline method. In inline method, uh, uh, the UVRX and uh, CellX, these are the two um, um, the methods that are available now. And uh, in offline method, we separate the component required uh, from the instrument and uh, then expose it to uh, UV rays and then it will be reinfused back to the uh, patient. So initially, uh, through FRSs, we separate WBC and plasma. It, uh, the 8 methoxys or alanine will be injected to this component and further it will be subjected to UVA radiation. And uh, following this treatment, uh, the modified uh, cellular components will be infused back to the patient. So typically mononuclear cells are obtained uh, by processing around 1.5 volume of whole blood. And uh, uh, after treating, it will be infused back. So um, the weekly or uh, every two to eight weeks, uh, this procedure can be repeated depending upon the condition and the goal of the therapy. So till now we have discussed about therapeutic efferesis mainly in adult cases. Uh, in pediatric cases, so there are uh, certain points that we need to look into. And uh, some of these technical considerations I would like to discuss here. The first point is about the circuit volume. So um, as we all know, we need to um, calculate and focus into the extracorporeal uh, blood volume, especially when we do a pediatric procedures, because it should not cross 10 to 15% of the total blood volume of the patient. So in some of the cases, we may have to do RBC priming. The second point is about vascular access. Uh, since cypheresis equipments exert uh, negative pressure, um, maybe around 20 to 40 ml per minute. So to withstand this, we need to have uh, more durable um, uh, catheters. And so central uh, lines are preferred in pediatric cases to have this constant uh, inflow. Third point about uh, the anticoagulation. So in uh, FRSS, we use citrate anticoagulation mainly. Whenever citrate anticoagulant is used, there is a risk of developing hypocalcemia. And uh, in addition to that, in some children, uh, when the citrate is more metabolized in liver, um, there can be increase in bicarbonate levels leading to metabolic alkalosis. So the electrolyte balance becomes quite complicated, uh, especially when the patient is uh, in critical care unit. Uh, here uh, we have a publication, a recent one, uh, uh, published in Frontiers of Pediatrics, where they have compared the complications and the safety of therapeutic efferesis in children. 
So they have noted that uh, the simple plasma exchange is associated with higher uh, adverse events compared to the other modalities like uh, whenever they have used absorption column um, for the procedure. This could be due to the use of replacement fluids like uh, plasma components. Uh, they concluded that therapeutic apheresis in childhood is quite a safe uh, treatment and uh, immune adsorption uh, columns usage is uh, associated with lower complications. Now coming to the adverse events related to the therapeutic apheresis, um, we have uh, World Apheresis Association registry data where they have compiled uh, the data of adverse events uh, of more than one lakh uh, procedures and they have categorized uh, the graded the side effects as mild, moderate, severe. Um, so there are four grades uh, basically and uh, um, they have noted that there is significant decrease in the occurrence of side effects uh, with over time. It was around 11% in 2003 and now in 2018 it was around 2.3%. So there is significant decrease in the um, adverse event rate with the, so that are associated with the therapeutic apheresis. It could be because of increased awareness or understanding about the procedure and um, uh, better uh, equipments that are available now. Um, and uh, some of the severe side effects that are uh, reported are uh, hypotension, urticaria, and uh, bronchospasm. And moderate uh, events that are reported included tingling, urticaria, hypotension, and some of the technical problems. And the most common mild adverse uh, events that are noted are uh, access problems and uh, mild hypotension in the patients. So these are the common adverse events and the very severe adverse events are very, very rare. So therapeutic apheresis uh, is a safe procedure and uh, most of the times it is life-saving, especially in category one indications. We need to adopt evidence-based practice and uh, create awareness about this uh, procedure and its clinical utility among uh, clinicians. Uh, understand the pathophysiology of each and every case and based on that we need to modify the treatment protocol. So with that I would like to conclude. Um, so um, thank, thank you once again madam for that wonderful presentation and in continuation with this webinar uh, a couple of our senders uh, would like to share their experience uh, uh, regarding a couple of few uh, cases where they have done therapeutic uh, plasma exchange, uh, therapeutic metrosis. Uh, so uh, first, uh, Dr. Linda John, uh, Assistant Professor, uh, Transition Medicine from Amruta Institute, Kochi. Uh, she will be sharing her experience with the red cell exchange in a pediatric patient with sickle cell disease. Over to you, Dr. Linda. Thank you, Timas, for giving me this opportunity. I would like to thank Shami Ma'am for a very informative session. Moving on to my case, uh, this is a case of a therapeutic red cell exchange in a pediatric patient. So this was a nine-year-old female child, non-case of homozygous sickle cell disease with recurrent history or episodes of sickle cell painful crisis. She was diagnosed at the age of two years and she was on cap hydroxyurea. And later it was increased to 500 mg OD for three by seven. Her both parents are carriers. Her recent hemoglobin electrophoresis showed a HBAC level of 62%. The child has been planned for a stem cell transplant. So before the transplant, the child required an exchange with a target of HBS less than 30%. So this, uh, this is uh, as far category one, as ma'am has explained. So before going into the uh, red cell exchange, you should know about what is the fractionated cell remaining. Ma'am has explained it really well. So based on that, we'll move, we'll move with the exchange procedure. So the pre transplant workup was done. The blood group was O positive. The baseline ICT and DCT was negative. So before uh, doing the procedure, the day before the procedure, we entered the patient's height, weight, and hematocrit into the system. We did the procedure in a spectra optia apheresis system. So in the system, we have when we entered the baseline height hematocrit, the patient the machine showed the volume has which has to be replaced. 
so it showed a volume of 1150 ml of rbc's to be exchanged so roughly we calculated as the volume to be uh, replaced was five donor units so we uh, there is also one app you can download it in the mobile phone from the play store from thermo bct you have a rbc exchange app with that also you can calculate the amount of rbc's which has to be arranged so that it helps you to arrange the rbc's the day before yesterday of the procedure so with that uh, after entering the procedure the machine also showed priming so i uh, had arranged six units of prbs all together one unit prbc for priming and five units for exchanging so ideally it has to be look reduced and cross matched and abo arch matched and also rs scale matched but since we didn't have the facility for abo uh, i'm sorry rs scale phenotyping we didn't do that and why we reached is that the patient is taken up for stem cell transplant the kit which we used was therapeutic plasma exchange kit and the consent was taken the access was uh, uh, was a femoral vein it was done since it was pediatric we did it under iv sedation and the procedure was done in a room because of the financial constraints we didn't do it in the iv uh, in the icu setup the patient was connected to the monitor and was monitored continuously during the procedure and iv calcium gluconate was given in the rate of 1 ml per kg per hour in 50 ml ns over the period of red cell exchange by using a infusion pump the patient data it was a female baby uh, i mean female child of 9 year old weight of 25 kg height 134 cm hematocrit of 29% was entered into system and system showed as a ma'am explains in pediatric more than 15% of tbv is outside the it's uh, the circuit it shows priming and uh, the average hematocrit of donor rbcs of five donor rbcs were entered into system it, which amounted to 57% so all these details we entered into the uh, system then we started the priming this is a picture showing a priming for priming one unit we already we had uh, kept uh, the day before itself for uh, after cross matching and uh, look reduced and related the how we do priming is that there's there's two axes one is for inlet and one is another one is for return so the inlet is connected with a um, Uh, with the transfusion, uh, I mean, the inlet is kind of the blood which we uh, transfuse is taken is connected to a connected with the um, blood transfusion set that you can see in the picture. It has been hanged, and that with the blood transfusion set, it is connected to a three way, and three way is connected to the inlet. And through the inlet, the blood will go to the uh, tubing set, and after priming the whole entire tubing set, it will go to the uh three way and three way will be connected to a, another iv set or transfer set which will be connected to a transfer bag so that the entire circuit will be primed with the donor rbc so after the procedure is completed with priming we will start we will resume with the procedure so moving on to the procedural parameter the patient blood volume which process was uh, 1867 ml the rbc volume removed was 1265 ml the rbc exchange volume is 1152 ml which uh, almost uh, around 500 five units of donor rbcs and the duration of procedure is 92 minutes the acd used is 184 ml target hematocrit we kept it as 30% because uh, for uh, after uh, the procedure the hb usually we keeps in between a 9 to 11 uh, in order to avoid any viscosity the target hbs percentage was kept as 20% the fractionated cell remaining is uh, 32% we have calculated based on the formula h post hbs divided by pre hbs into 100 which is equal to 20 by 62 into 100 62 was the pre hbs and post hbs we kept it around 20 which is 32% so fractionated cells remaining is the amount, the number of cells that is sickle cells remaining in the patient circulation after the exchange which roughly calculates after exchanging five units of rbcs with the donor and uh, after removing the patient cells how many cells will be remaining in the fract in the patient is the fcr so after doing the procedure we reported the we repeated the hplc and the post hbs came as 16% so this is the picture showing the procedure the defective blood cells have been removed in the big, that bag which you can see a big bag hanging around that is a So amount of cells which we have removed and you can see small bags which are donor cells which we have uh, we have we have been doing we have been uh, exchanging one by one that is donor cells removed 
So if you compare with the pre-procedure and post-procedure, HB before the procedure was 9.3 gram per deciliter. After the procedure, we could reach, we can keep it around 11. And HCT before procedure was 29. After procedure, it was kept around 32%. Plated count was 3,47. Post-procedure, it is 2,23,000. Uh, and the HPS from pre-procedure with one procedure, 62%, we could uh, reduce it to uh, 16%. So the entire procedure went uh, uneventful and the stem cell transplant was done six days back uh, from her sister. The donor is her sister, 12 year old, which is a full match, 12 by 12 match. And she's been, uh, she's, uh, she was sickle uh, for screen negative and she was not a carrier. So from with a count of CD34, 6.4 to 10 to the power of six cells from her sister, stem cell was transplant also done. And she is also doing well now. And the procedure, whole entire procedure went uneventful. Thank you for your patient listening. This is my experience from our center, Amruta. Thank you, Dr. Linda, for sharing your experience. Uh, so audience, if you have any queries, you can ask. If you don't have any queries, uh, before we begin the next presentation, I would like to uh, tell the audience that uh, uh, we have shared a link for the feedback form and certificate in the chat box. Uh, and uh, the Kerala State Medical Council has agreed to uh, as, uh, predicted the uh, sorry, uh, Kerala State Medical Council has predicted the 0.5 uh, hours uh, CME credit for this uh, particular event. So I would request you all to uh, fill that form. And with that, um, I would invite the second speaker, uh, the third speaker for the day, uh, Dr. Priya Pisa, consultant translation medicine at Believers Be 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 Medical College, Thiruvalla. She'll be sharing her experience uh, with plated addresses. And Dr. Priya, you can start your presentation. Yes, sir. So is my screen visible? Yes, you are visible. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Transfusion Medicine Academic Society and Dr. Rafi for giving me this opportunity to share my experience on thrombocytophoresis. Um, so we did this procedure uh, in July this year. Thrombocytophoresis is also known as platelet depletion and it is used in patients who have thrombocytosis. So thrombocytosis is basically defined as a circulating platelet count of more than 4.5 lakhs. And according to ASPA, uh, the platelet depletion is indicated as a therapeutic or a prophylactic treatment modality. If it's therapeutic, it's category 2 and prophylactic category 3, as was discussed by Dr. Shami ma'am. Um, this platelet depletion has a very, has a weak recommendation with a low quality evidence. So the grade is 2C. So the patient profile was that the patient was a 54 year old male patient who was diagnosed with polycythemia vera in the year 2002. The same year, the patient underwent splenectomy because he had a road traffic accident. The following year, the patient had a transient ischemic attack. At that time, uh, his echocardiography report was suggestive of LVH and his bone marrow findings were consistent with the polycythemia vera. Consequently, he was uh, started on routine therapeutic phlebotomy with uh, hydroxyurea. And over the years, the patient developed uh, chronic, uh, chronic kidney disease and he was managed conservatively for that. So this patient was referred to our hospital and when he came here, his CBC, his CBC showed platelet count of around 16 lakhs. So the hematologist decided to give him injection cytosine at that time, but uh, within, the span, within the span of 24 hours, his uh, platelet count increased from 16 to 19 lakhs. Keeping in view our past history of TIA, we went ahead with thrombocytophoresis. So this was the patient data that we entered. The, the apheresis machine that we used was the spectra optia. Because we were not able to get a peripheral line in this patient, uh, we went ahead with a femoral line. And these were the parameters that were entered. So the software, uh, the procedure software we selected was platelet depletion. And the kit which we used here is the same kit which we use for CMNC collection or stem cell collection. And these are the images of the procedure. And here we can see that the collect, the collect port is kept in the last column of the collection preference range. And uh, the, uh, the procedure took around two and a half hours to complete. Total blood volume process was around 1.6. And we were able to get a platelet yield of 73.4. 
and we did not use any replacement fluid. The patient was hemodynamically stable throughout the procedure and he did not have any, any symptoms of citrate toxicity. So um, most of the, um, the, the documentations, uh, they have mentioned that each procedure of platelet depletion helps to lower the platelet count by around 30 to 60 percent. In our case, we observed a drop by 76 percent. So the platelet counts decreased from 19 lakhs to 4.54 lakhs in this patient. And we did only one procedure in this patient. And this was a case of primary, um, uh, this thing, of primary thrombocyto uh, thrombocytosis. These were the lab reports post-procedure. Patient is right now doing fine. He is asymptomatic and uh, he's regularly following up in the hemat OPD. So the take-home message is essential thrombocyte uh, cytemia is one of the MPNs which is characterized by a persistent platelet count of more than 4.5 lakhs. There can be mutations, JAK2, uh, uh, CAL reticulin, MPL mutations, and uh, thrombocytosis can either be primary or secondary. Secondary is usually, as ma'am already discussed, it could be a reactive thrombocytosis, which occurs due to infections, inflammations, or patients who have undergone a splenectomy. Primary thrombocytosis, it includes all the hematological abnormalities. And the other major difference between these two types of thrombocytosis is that in secondary th thrombocytosis, the platelets, they are functionally normal. Whereas in primary thrombocytosis, the platelets, they are functionally abnormal. So these are the patients who will have uh, thrombohemorrhagic events as was, you know, ex expected in our patient. So the goal of thrombocytopheresis is to alleviate symptoms and to minimize complications of the disease, either thrombotic events or bleeding events. And also to, to treat any rebound thrombocytosis in a patient who has, who has undergone a splenectomy and in also the pregnant females to prevent recurrent fetal loss in high-risk patients of polycythemia vera or uh, essential thrombocythemia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Priya. Uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Rafi to say a few words. Uh, on behalf, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, on behalf of uh, Timas, I would like to thank uh, Shami ma'am for that extensive and elaborate talk on the applications of therapeutic emphasis. Thank you from our part to to oh, to madam.